Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Matt Murray. I'm the executive editor of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you for what I'm sure is going to be a lively discussion on technology today. Um, it's been interesting, I think, this year to be at Davos for a lot of us and, 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 and hear the technological discussion. Uh, in one sense, we were just discussing, you know, uh, before the, 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 the panel, Everybody's feeling probably as good about the economy as they have in a long time uh, at Davos from, from the time I've been coming. Uh, in, in America, the, the economic uh, headwinds are feeling pretty good. In Europe, uh, people are feeling better about the state of Europe than they have in some time since I've been here. But there's technology angst in the air in a way that I haven't seen here before. And there's been a lot of talk about technology issues here. You've heard some of it on some of the stages uh, here. Uh, and, and, and issues like that we're all dealing with, that we're all thinking about as technology changes and, and as the speed of it, automation and AI and what that means for the workforces and how that feeds our societies. Industries everywhere are being disrupted, retail, heavy industry, my industry, media is one of the ones that's felt a lot. Fake news is obviously high on the agenda. Antitrust has been talked about a lot this week. You know, among the remarks that have stood out, I think this week have been remarkable, was Mark Benioff of Salesforce comparing big tech now to tobacco. Uh, and then followed up uh, by Martin Sorrell, not to be out provoked, comparing big tech to Standard Oil in the uh, heyday of, uh, of uh, oil industry. And, and yesterday, Sundar Pichai uh, at Google uh, talking about these issues and saying we've got to solve it by thinking ahead and worrying. So what I hope we have is a panel of thinkers and warriors to talk about some of these issues, and I, and I want to uh, introduce them to you. Uh, Ulrich uh, Spieshofer uh, of uh, ABB is uh, to my left. Uh, next to him, we've got uh, Ya Qin Zhang, the president of Baidu, the search engine giant in China. Ursula Burns is here. She's the chairman of the supervisory board of Vion. And of course, the former chairman and CEO of Xerox. Um, we've got Dan Schulman of PayPal. It's good to have you here. And finally, Vittorio Kalau, the CEO of Vodafone. So thank you all for coming in. Um, I'm going to start by talking about one of the topics that I know you're interested in, uh, Uli, and that's uh, automation. And, and, and uh, ABB has a big business in automation. You have been, I think it's fair to say, uh, a bull about what technology can do for the workforce despite displacement. So, Knowing that you, you've said that uh, over time you think technology and the technological revolution will create more jobs than it displaces. Talk a little bit about, though, there's no doubt that real displacement is, is, is happening and that real pain is happening. So how do you see particularly the middle tier workforce changing and evolving in the next 10 or 15 years? Uh, how serious will the kind of displacement that they face be? And, and what specific things can we do in terms of retraining or offsetting as new jobs come into being? How do you see the challenges there? Yeah, thank you very much for the question and thank you for having me here today. Um, we run one of the largest robotics businesses in the world and we are number two in industrial automation. So we get confronted with that question every day. And I just want to put it in context quickly. If you look at where mankind was in 1990, we had one third of mankind living below the extreme poverty line. And today, it's 8%. Mm -hmm. And one reason that it, this was possible, that shift was possible, was the smart use of technology in a way to drive productivity, wealth, and prosperity. And that's what we need to have in mind when we have a North Star in front of us. Where do we want to go and what do we want to achieve? It's very clear that the fourth industrial revolution has a couple of characteristics that are absolutely unique and therefore are challenging us a little bit different than the previous ones. Number one, this is the first revolution that leaves the factory door and goes into every single job. Number two, it is faster than ever before. So in the past, we could re really say technological advance, no problem. The dad learned one job, the son learns the next job. No problem at all, we get that covered. Today, it's intragenerational change at a pace that we have never seen before. So what does that really mean for our workforce? What does that mean going forward? We are actively in our own enterprise constantly improving productivity, whether it's in the white color area or in the blue color area. Nobody in the blue color area is concerned about the fourth industrial revolution. Everybody in the white color area is really concerned about that part because that's the part where not, not much happened in the past. And what do we need to do there? We need to redeploy people, we need to educate people, and we need to make sure we create enough additional demand 
through the output what we're doing with our companies to make sure we safeguard employment at a certain level. Mm -hmm. Let me give you the example of our own robotics business. We used to do castings where people were grinding the castings for the robot arms and make sure that they go out in the right quality. These jobs are gone. Mm -hmm. They are out. We used to do a lot of administration. That's all done with e-fulfillment. But we have today more app developers to put the purpose on the robots than we have ever had before. And a lot of people think an app developer and a solution developer needs to be an engineer. That's not true. We use very often skilled workers that are used in certain manufacturing processes that know how a process works and we re redeploy them in app development and say, you go together with a couple of digital natives and you show us how you develop solutions in the environment where you used to be. So I think we really need to take the people with us to get going in that direction. I want to press you that on that. When you say we take the people, I mean at Davos, we, we, we do go to panels and you do talk about uh, sort of broad uh, ideas of moving forward together and retraining the workforce. Who does that? Are, are workers on their own? Do they all have to do that themselves. Do companies have a responsibility? Do governments have a responsibility? How do you make it happen? Because I, there's no doubt that, that while in, in the abstract, I, I don't think people disagree with what you're saying, hundreds of thousands of individuals feel left out and don't know what to do. So how do you, how do you who owns that? I think first it, it starts with us as leaders. We personally need to take a responsibility and say, how do I shape the future there? Second, we need to make sure we work together between government, education, and companies. It's very clear when, when we say education lifelong, we don't mean a school bench in brick and mortar where people sit down and go to school. Yeah. We need to have new formats in there altogether. I give you a case, and I mentioned that this morning in another environment. We had a situation where we significantly reduced our white color workforce in the administrative areas through using really sm smarter digital processes, the right software support and whatever. At the same time, we worked with the HR people and looked at the age pyramid of our people and uh, uh, on the people that were leaving the workforce. Now, one option would have been, let's fire the people. In this example, it was Germany. Pay 100,000 bucks each, get them out and hire new people. The option that we choose was, we look carefully who could be trained into what job? We spent 35,000 bucks per person retraining into new jobs or in jobs that where people were retiring. Mm. We asked the people, you need to contribute. For half a year, you go two, two nights a week and one Saturday, you go to school. When, you, when your job goes, you go into a new, new role and off you go. You cannot do that with everybody but you can do it in more areas than you think. Well, and, and quickly on that, Germany has a pretty tough labor law. <laughs> it's pretty hard to fire people. All yeah. executives know that. Arguably, the economic incentive you describe, it, that's a better path in Germany than, in, than in many other countries. So do you, do you favor that kind of, uh, and, that kind of legislation and on the even, government? Law? Even if I wouldn't have to pay it, honestly, the impact that it had on the workforce was something that I totally underestimated because the morale of the, of the people was, OK, we need to become more productive, but the company is doing a lot to re-employ as much as we can. And that, I think, is an e effect that we shouldn't forget. I'd like to ask Ursula to jump in, because at Xerox, you, you lived with restructuring and challenges for quite a long time. And, and yet, I have to say, and may, maybe, maybe this makes sense, anxiety among workers broadly on these things has grown, not abated, even though we've been talking for a long time about what workers need to do. And even though it is a fact that some workers are being retrained and adapting. So, so when you think about how you really do that and make workers involved and, 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 uh, and, and sort of quell the anxiety and really pull off this transformation, how do we do it? Who's responsible? I think, it's a, I think I agree with Uli in a, in a lot of ways um, in that it's a, it's a coalition of responsibility. Mm. Uh, clearly, the corporations, and it's not always the corporations looking at their P&L, their bottom mm. line. Mm. Most of the time, it's a lot softer views, even though people don't think that corporations run that way. So one, it's at the corporation level. It's definitely at the employee level. And oftentimes, it's at the government, generally state and local level, mm. that puts a lot of pressure on where, in the United States at least, mm. on where you take work from and where you put it in, depending on government contracts. The interesting thing about all of this is at the end of the day, we have to fire a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> at the end of the day, even with all the retraining, automation, productivity without automation, just a general move 
in doing work better. We will require required Xerox every year, every year, to retrain but also restructure a significant amount of people, and it's very unsettling for the workforce. Well, I mean, that, that's, that's part of the economic argument, yeah, right? Is, for the is, companies need to make money, and automation means efficiency. But right? it's also, it's more than even making money. It doesn't make sense. We're not charities, right? And so it doesn't make a lot of sense to do things inefficiently mm. ju just to keep people working. Mm. So there is a, there is a natural, <clears throat> there's a mirror that we're going to have to look at as a country and as a world when we actually are faced with the fact that I can actually answer phone calls, we had a big call center business, with 50% of the people that I currently have. Because automation, so I can say, okay, I can slow that down and I, I'll cut my profits a little bit, but it's totally against human nature mm -hmm. to do. It's definitely against business. So, so that's the problem. <laughs> what do you, do you, what's the solution for those and this people? Is where I, this is where I don't know the answer yeah. fully. Yeah. Right? This is where we're all struggling. Yeah. Because we're and gonna miss this, there's a whole generation of people who are waiting to enter the workforce and people who are there that we're going to literally displace. We're gonna have to figure out jointly, governments, educational institutions, companies, what do we do with these people? Because as Uli said, the pace at which this is happening is faster than ever before. So we're now flooding the space with these people where, where before it was a trickle and, and we could deal with it. And Vittorio, you, you, you've spoken about seeing uh, Th that wave coming as well in, in, in some overseas markets where that, that had benefited in the last 20 years from offshoring, but automation uh, 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 having a reverse effect. Yeah, <clears throat> in a big way. Uh, and between, uh, I agree that everything that Ulrich said is great, but I am a little bit more on uh, Ursula's side. And I really think this is not really a corporate kind of thought. It's more of a political, social thought. We are at a point where I truly believe we need to think how to use the progress of technology to change some of the basics of our societies in terms of what we define a public good that citizens are entitled to. And technology, through you know, big data, through a much better understanding of how things go, can deliver this. I'm referring of the kind of, we, we call populisms very often the yeah. self-defense you know, normal people have against this fear of technology. Can we turn it into something that gives them a gain? Is there a way to use technology to improve environment, to improve health, to improve the classic public goods, security, education? Now, I do believe that the opportunities are immense, but of course, this requires a redefinition of what is the role of the state, what is the role of the NGOs or the sector, and also how we make cooperation work yeah. through technology to improve so that those who are displaced, but also the others who fear to be displaced, start saying, well, maybe this technology is going to take away something <coughs> from my job, but maybe I will live in a better environment. Maybe I will have <coughs> better health. Maybe I will have, you know, better education. And I know it's a hot political topic, yeah. for example, but well, there's so much that technology can deliver in the next 15 years, we need to get organized but, to deliver to the people. Otherwise, self-defense, i.e. populism, yeah. will stop and we'll get hiring freeze and uh, you know you cannot the robot tax, all these things that honestly, we know they are short term. Well, we're reading, reading between the lines, it sounds like you, you really are, are, are wanting a, a different sort of fundamental shift in government's role and how they think about these issues as a new society emerges because you know, obviously, I do. Is that, is that, that's, that's I do, fair. I do. I mean, uh, uh, we had this morning a, an interesting panel. It's very interesting. We find that, for example, mayors, so mayors of cities, which are contained environments, mm -hmm. are more progressive, more advanced Absolutely. in thinking, Absolutely. how can I use technology to improve the life of my citizens? Mm -hmm. Why? Because they know that, you know, they see the citizens, they are mayors. They see, you know, they see mm -hmm. that every day they walk home and somebody tells them, hey, why don't you do this? There is a tremendous opportunity there. Who's going to deliver that? We cannot deliver with bigger states. It has to be a cooperation, public, private. I do believe NGOs can evolve a lot, and we are working with some NGOs, social entrepreneurs, people who want to make a living out of technology and social good. The opportunity in the next 10, 15 years is huge, but the states are not organized for that. Mm. But, by the way, if I may, industry isn't either, right? So, and we are not, yeah, of course. Right, so we have to actually figure out a way to have a conversation as industry groups or as a big industry with government. So we say that the government's not organized and they're not, but neither are we. So we, and the people definitely are more yeah. organized than either the government or, 
or the industry? Well, I think that that, I, I, I know you want to uh, uh, weigh in, but uh, one, quick, one quick one, and I think I fully agree with, with Rosalind I'm in, in Vittorio. Nobody talks about charity here, but you have to grow in a new shape. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, in, to just give you our example, we had about eight years ago, we had about a billion service business. Today, it's eight billion. And the eight billion was a fantastic opportunity to re redeploy people that already knew ABB. If you don't grow in a new shape, you need to restructure and you need to get rid of the people. That's very clear. Productivity will be demanded by your shareholders, will be demanded by everybody that's a part of a normal commercial enterprise. But I think this, this ambition to grow in a new shape, that's one thing that can help to mitigate the impact. If you don't do that as a leader, then you're stuck. If you're constant, then you're stuck because you're not creating new employment opportunities. Uh, that's a good transition to, to uh, uh, one of the big uh, drivers, maybe arguably the biggest driver now in tech, which is China, Yachin. And, and you, I, I know you recently told us in an interview, uh, China now has a structural advantage on AI. And, and, and interestingly, at least from the outsider perspective, when we talk about government, business, aligning and jobs, in many ways, uh, China uh, uh, seems to be moving ahead now and, and pushing on this front. Um, and obviously that comes from the Western perspective with serious shortcomings, including uh, surveillance issues or the facial technology. But China's been moving ahead, not as hampered. Uh, do, do, do you think we are too hung up on these things in the West? Do you think China's a model for the rest of us and that China's now setting the pace of where we'll all end up? Yes. <laughs> but, uh, nice to be back. Yeah. 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 Uh, I remember you know, two years ago, precisely, in uh, Davos, and I think it was this room, yeah. we talk about you know, technology, talk about you know, AI, and talk about, and also all the concerns you know, come with uh, uh, machine learning and AI. Um, and things have evolved quite a bit in the last uh, two years. You know? In fact, I like this session. It's, it's a high, uh, tech, high tech. Uh, high impact and will add uh, high responsibility mm. of, of big tech, the big uh, mm. uh, responsibility. If you look at in the first time in the history, all the biggest companies in terms of market cap are technology companies, are AI companies. And in the last few years, and China has progressed so much. Right now, four out of the top 10 companies uh, internet and technologies are from China, uh, and you know I mentioned about talk about the the structural advantage of China. Uh, it's uh, uh, you know has several dimensions. If you look at in, in the last uh, uh, you know in, in the last uh, you know, twenty years, United States was the only country that has uh, all the pillows in place to nurture a large scale companies, and obviously the talent technology, and market, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, all the uh, uh, regulatory or capital, mm -hmm. right, the capital, and plus the, the regulation policies. And, it, and China, for the first time, has all those pillars. I would say you know, for technology and the talent in the AI area, China still has a gap. Mm. Uh, you know, if you look at all the advanced you know, machine learning algorithm, that's, that's a gap. But gap is quickly closing. I'll talk more about that later on. But in terms of the scale, in terms of uh, the capital, China uh, actually are probably a little bit ahead. Yeah. And also China has a more, uh, I would say, uh, more friendly regulatory environment. Well, yeah, I, I, but I, I want to press on that a bit. Yeah. You were at Microsoft a long time. You yes. lived in the US. You, you know, you know uh, uh, how, how people view things in the West. And right. I mean, even as people acknowledge China is starting to advance, <clears throat> there's obviously a lot of concern. When you say friendly regulatory environment, a lot of people think, yeah, the state dominates. Mm -hmm. uh, individual rights are not worried about. There's a lot of data that the state collects. Surveillance right. technology that, is not, freely deployed. Well, I, I, but, no, no, but, but that's what I'm asking. Uh -huh. the surveillance technology uh -huh. is more freely deployed in China. Uh -huh. So uh, that's, that's exactly what I want to press you on. Are we just too hung up on those things? And it's not, it, it, or are there, are China able to do some things that would not be doable in, in Europe or the United right. States? Yeah, I, you know, uh, things are changing. Uh, if you look at, in China, you know, there's a lot of uh, you know, application for face recognition, you know, mm -hmm. uh, live cast, uh, monitoring surveillance uh, from a number of companies. Uh, but we see the, 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 the uh, uh, awareness 
right, for privacy uh, is, uh, is uh, rising. Yeah. And you know, there, I wouldn't yeah. name company. Uh, a few months ago, a company was uh, installing uh, the live uh, vi uh, uh, video camera right, mm -hmm. in different places. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the user, uh, you know, they were shopping, they were you know, in the gym, they were live casted to the social uh, network. Um, and there was a lot of uh, uh, complaints, a lot of issues, and then they had to uh, disable that service. Yeah. So I think things are, things are changing. Uh, when I say China has a structural advantage, uh, uh, there are a few. One is China has uh, actually, you know, if you look at the just internet, right? in the PC internet, China was a follower technology and products. And in the mobile internet, actually China, uh, I would say technology-wise, still uh, followed the US. But in terms of application, in terms of uh, infrastructure, <coughs> user experience, China is probably ahead. And you know, we talk about payment. China is, uh, is actually you know, a cashless society. Well, yeah, I want, and, I, and I do want to bring Dan, <laughs> I, I, I do want to bring so, so uh, the, the vast amount of data and, and you know, application scenario uh, are the uh, you know, prepare well for China to uh, for the for the AI age and you know and Baidu that's why we put a lot of investment and R and D into AI. I talk more about that. Mm. Uh, we actually transform the company you know, into an AI company. Yeah, and I want to come back to that. But Dan, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt there. But Dan, you've spent time in China recently, and obviously PayPal is about being cashless, and you can go to Shenzhen and never need any currency at all. Is, is China our future too? Do you see the same kind of uh, model as Shenzhen emerging in the West? Should it, should it, or will it, or, or will it be modified or need to be? Mm -hmm. Well, I think as I travel around the world, there's sort of a more similarity and there are differences in a lot of ways. And there's a, a universal truth that I see as I go around the world and that is uh, it's expensive to be poor. And we talk about populism, we talk about anger, uh, but that's really true in financial services. If you're excluded from the system, um, things that we take for granted, just paying a bill or cashing a check or sending yeah, money to somebody you love, getting yeah. credit, you know, they're either impossible to do or they're incredibly time consuming or cost a, a ton of money. And uh, whether you're in China or the US, you might think of those as two very different markets. You have tremendous numbers of underserved populations. On the US, 50% of US uh, adults have less than $400 of savings. Um, they're struggling to make ends meet at the end of the month. And we wonder why they're worried not just about technology, but they're worried about their future. They're worried whether their kids will have a better future than they do. In the UK, 40% of families have less than 100 pounds of savings. And so my view on this is, you know, technology can be something, and you know, you talked about this, can be something that radically changes the way we serve underserved markets. And, you know, technology is a tool, like any other tool. If it's used the right way, it can be very productive. And if it's in the wrong hands, it can uh, sometimes be harmful. But my view is we should be able to democratize financial services through the use of technology, that managing and moving money should be a right for every citizen and not a privilege for the affluent. And we should be able to save a tremendous amount of money. In the US, this is the US, $141 billion was spent on fees and interest for the underserved market. That's 10% of their disposable income. We should be able to, with technology, to do that anywhere from 40 to 80% less. Imagine if you could return half of that or a quarter of that to those underserved populations. What you could do to their psyche, what you could do for training, what you could do for savings. So I think that technology, and I think we have the obligation to assure this, that technology should be a force for good, and companies need to stand up and make sure that that happens. Well, what do we need? Can, can you give us any specific thoughts on, on, on what we would need to do? I mean, I think, yeah, Chin, I think it's fair to say uh, in China that, that when you talk about structural advantages, part of it is that right now in a place like Shenzhen, you've got the government and the private sector working together actively on 
these kinds of initiatives. We, we don't really, you know, the, the situation here is not really the same as that. And of course, in China, people want to get things done, they get them done. Is that a model that can work for us? Or do we need a different model? Is the, what's your, what, what do you think needs to happen to bring about the vision you're painting? Yeah. Honestly, as I go around and talk to regulators around the world, I can, speaking to the PBOC, mm -hmm. to the CFPB, uh, to European regulators, what do they want? They basically want to protect their citizens. They want to make sure that there's a safe and secure and sound environment, that uh, there's transparency in what we're trying to go do. And you know, when I go to uh, Washington and I talk about financial inclusion, I talk about democratizing financial services, I say all the time, it's not a red issue or a blue issue, it's a red, white, and blue issue. Mm. This is something that's universal. This is something that I think every regulator uh, supports and wants to accomplish. Um, there may be ways that we need to create sandboxes in regulations to experiment. Um, we can use data and information now through AI to look at modeling. And right now, just our models uh, at PayPal are 16 to 19% more effective than traditional FICO scores. Mm. What does that mean? It means that we can responsibly lend credit to more and more of those populations that really desperately need it and do so responsibly and, do, and they can responsibly take on that credit. And I, I just think that technology can spur a number of innovations. Small business is another great example. Small business, we have loaned three or four billion dollars now to small businesses. 25% of our loans have gone to the 3% businesses in the 3% of counties mm. where 10 or more banks have closed branches. And the average sales go up 22% versus the control group that goes up 2% where we lend that money. And by the way, it's in neighborhoods where the, the income average is below the national median because that's where banks uh, close branches because it's hard to be profitable in those stages and therefore, <laughs> We're loaning to more minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses. So yeah, I happen to be very optimistic and actually very determined that we should be able to make a difference with technology. It's interesting you say that, though, because JP Morgan, for instance, with its tax uh, windfall that other companies are doing, is spending part of it building new branches. And I think that's I great, this. by the way, yeah. because the less banking deserts we have, the better off we can be. I want, I want to bring you in, uh, Ursula, because you, you ran a big company in America dealing with this for a long time, and so you've seen things through the American lens. But now you're also at Vion going to uh, some of these new emerging markets, markets. And, and seeing yeah. things. So, I mean, I guess I, 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 mean, I, guess I, I how are things viewed differently in those markets? Are we, in, the, in, in sort of the developed West and the United States, too, too hung up on some of the privacy issues and other things? Or, no, I, I, th I actually think... Um, countries are countries for a reason, meaning they have their own practices, mm -hmm. their own history, their own um, personalities. So this idea that there is a better, that China is better than the United States mm -hmm. or that somebody's going fast or slow, I actually throw that all out the window. I think that I one of the ways that we're going to do things is there are different models all over the place. Yeah. And we're getting a little bit too wrapped up about who's faster or slower. Mm -hmm. I, I, it, it's fine. I actually don't believe it's a, it's a big issue. I'm hoping that China is very successful, but I also hope that we are, and so is Armenia, mm -hmm. in the ways that they want to do things, right? Or else we'd have a, a borderless world, and that I don't think is coming anytime soon. So that's w one area. I think the other area is what, what Dan said. What we have to actually figure out a way to do is to make um, the bare requirements of life available to as many people yeah. as possible. Yeah. And the way to do that is to actually have competitive models, right? And the be generally, in the world, the competitive model, the best wins. So some societies have cash, we have branches, we'll have paperless and payless. I'm, I'm for it all. And eventually, we'll figure out in these very specific economies around the world what's best for them at the time that they are in, if we have responsible governments. And, and over time, we do. It's not always clear. Uh, that the best, the biggest nations have the most responsible governments. But, but I, and so I do business today, Vian does business in Armenia and Russia, very, uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, Algeria, and all, mm. when you go place to place, it's extremely different. Every one of these countries are different, mm. different paces, different models, 
and I respect them all, and, they'll, and they mix. One of the things I'll say is, well, fast, these guys go really slow and then fast, and then really slow and then fast. So they jump over, they, you go to Armenia and you say, my goodness, this is a country that's living in the past, and you look at how they actually do commerce, how they, go, how they do telecommunications. They are jumping over um, a large amount of mistakes or infrastructure that developed economies mm -hmm. did. Yeah. So this slow to fast, I think, is and definitely in financial services they're doing yeah. that. India and China are perfect examples yeah. of that. Leapfrogging. Leapfrogging. Leapfrogging yeah. older technology. I, I also don't think, think there's this need for us all to be like the same. Yeah. Uh, it's an important I, thing to I learn. I do think it also demands we rethink our business models a little sure. bit. I, I believe right now that there has to be cooperation amongst uh, many companies to really think about how do we take the best of our assets, the best of another uh, company's assets, bring them together to hyperserve uh, consumers. And technology allows us to do that. I think, for instance, you know, we're not trying to disrupt the financial system. We're actually trying to work hand in hand with banks mm -hmm. and take the best of what they have. Either it may be their assets, their branches, the best of what we have, which may be digital distribution, and put them together into unique value propositions. I think the power of platforms is that you can, through Absolutely. tool sets and APIs, you can actually start taking assets, mixing and matching them together, where you really actually, the, the enemy, in my view, uh, financial services is cash. Mm. And it, because it's inefficient, there's tremendous leakage in that. In India alone, already they believe that they've saved billions of dollars of uh, welfare benefits that go to the, to the uh, most underserved. And so to me, that's the promise, and I think we have to do this thinking about ecosystems coming together to serve that. Now, that's hard, mm. and we've got to do it in private-private in partnerships and private-public partnerships. And, and Victoria was speaking about that a little bit earlier, yeah. about this idea that we can create um, the future. We're going to have to create the future. Yeah. They're not these machines. Well, yeah, I, and, and, I, and, I, and I think, and I think that you know, when you talk about it, it's it's compelling, and yet there's the, the displacement issue, the unsettlement mm -hmm. that people mm -hmm. feel. Those royals, that's going to be with us for a long time to come, really. And this is where government can help. Yeah. <laughs> this, I mean, because the, the policy that we, the policies and the distribution of wealth through a social network is not something that companies do very well. Mm. They actually just don't do it at all very well. We absolutely do have to have a lot more collaboration between companies and governments yep. to figure out how do you smooth some of these transitions. Because this, this, the problem happens in the transition time. Mm. Right? Once you're settled, it's, everybody kind of figures it out. I want to Except back. for women and girls, by the way. <laughs> we have to start talking about women and girls because they don't participate evenly at all. They are left out of the system across the board in just about every, con in every country. Yeah. Um, so we have to figure out a different way to engage women and girls. Well, I, I, the reason why governments and business want to work together is that if you're in a democracy, a democracy needs to be more than two wolves yeah. and a lamb voting on what to have for dinner, right? So think about that. Um, <laughs> it, that means you have to rise above your own self-interest. And if you're worried about making ends meet, you're voting against the system. Mm -hmm. That's what you're not necessarily voting for something, but you're voting against the system mm -hmm. and you're angry. But if we can make those basic human rights that you were talking about more affordable, take away some of that anxiety, mm -hmm. I think we can have like better functioning economies, better functioning societies. And I think that's incumbent on us as businesses to to help to lead. Absolutely. I think businesses can I, can't <clears throat> stand on the sideline anymore. They have to be a force for good. It, it's, 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 a, it's a great point. I, I want to pivot it. We've got uh, two more topics I do want to try to hit here, and I want to go back because I promise you, Achin, we do it and talk about AI. And again, you hear AI here at Davos. AI, AI, AI. Companies are excited about it. I'm not sure they all really know what's coming or what it means. Uh, I think if anyone does, it's Baidu. And, and, and when we talk about change as well as some of the anxiety it brings, if you looked out, 10 years on the horizon in terms of our everyday lives, what will AI mean for us? How transformative and you know, will it be for us? Yeah. Well, you know, there is a little bit of uh, you know, hype and, and bubble yeah. uh, in AI, and I admit, uh, but AI is real and is uh, transformative. Um, and if you look at, it's, it's not about future, it is, it is now. You know, for example, Baidu, 
we use AI to elevate our existing search engine uh, to uh, make uh, uh, our contents more personalized uh, you know, using you know, live feeds. We use voice recognition to uh, you know, use voice to search, use video to search. Uh, and also we create uh, new uh, categories. Uh, you know, last time I talked about Tom's driving. This is not only about uh, a business opportunity, uh, it, is, it will bring in tremendous social benefits. We we'll reduce the accident rates. Uh, uh, right now in China, uh, 500 people are killed every day. Uh, autonomous driving will bring that uh, down to a factor of, uh, of 10. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, uh, and mo most of the accident right now is uh, uh, caused by human error, you know, 90% human error. And also will uh, you know, increase efficiency uh, of uh, just the whole transportation. How might I feel in my job and my life? Yeah. I mean, is AI, right. so I mean, me, a lot of people want to know, is it a threat to me, is it a threat? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, of course, there are concerns. Uh, and you know, we are building, for example, a, a face recognition system in the Beijing airports. So you go there, you don't have to you know, do all this, uh, all this uh, uh, check, and, and it will accelerate the whole pace. Uh, and in our company, you, know, you don't need a badge. You can pay your uh, sandwich with, with your face. Uh, and you know, so things are happening that will benefit yeah. uh, the society tremendously. Yes, there are, there are downsides, there are concerns. We all have to face it. Uh, and let me, let me just go back a little bit philosophically. Yeah. You know, we are the only species who are able to understand, decode, and transform ourselves. So a uh, human being will become a better being, <laughs> a better version in, in the next 10 years or 20 years. And this includes ability to create, innovate, and there's no, no limit at all. But also this includes ability to resolve problems, to solve the issues we talk about. You know, as, uh, uh, in fact, the, 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 we are talking about this issue, it's, it's a great starting point. And, this, uh, you know, uh, two years ago, I, I made the, the point, I believe AI uh, is uh, the uh, engine for the fourth industry revolution. Mm. And you know, if you look at the first three revolution, steam engine, electrification, you know, or and information, none of this revolution has eliminated jobs. It has displaced jobs, created more jobs more creative jobs, more uh, uh, you know, higher quality jobs, uh, and the more honorable jobs. Yeah. I just don't know what job will be created. Right? Uh, I'll give you an example in China. Uh, there are uh, small you know, vendors, street vendors, and you know, they have to close uh, their, their shops. But then they move to Taobao, right? and then they actually make more profit, more money. And you know, at one point, the, the, the factories, the bicycle factories in Tianjin, they all lost their jobs. They just co closed all the plants. And with the, the ride sharing and all the bicycles, hundreds of thousands of people you know, actually working to produce bicycles. A lot of examples are like that. I actually don't know exactly what jobs will be created. Uh, and with e-commerce, a lot of people actually you know, uh, uh, doing logistical deliveries. Mm -hmm in China, which is, again, a problem, you know, create all the congestions. And in Baidu, we create hundreds of thousands of jobs using AI. For example, there are a lot of people doing annotation, labeling for, for data, right? whether it's for tons of driving or it's for you know, face recognition. There are a lot of people just doing that job. That job are better probably than uh, some other uh, uh, you know, physical work. So overall, you know, I'm confident, but as a company, as a society, we need to be conscious of that. You know, we need to uh, have the right education training uh, to reskill people. Uh, in fact, in the school, education, just the knowledge itself is not enough. It's ability to adapt, to learn new things. And, and I wanna, and I wanna take the, to go up the panel and then we'll, we'll go to questions out there, but, but that's a good place to take me uh, to, to a question I wanna ask each of you. So I think we, we've covered some ground about the promise of technology and also you know, sort of the perils or worries about it. And as we said, that's been in the air. So Oli, I wanna start with you and I wanna go down the panel. If there's one specific thing you could do 
that would affect the course of, tech, of, of our development in the next 20 years, whether it's yes, uh, you know, a, a regulatory kind of a thing or, or another approach. What do you think, given where we are now, what do you think needs, needs to happen to get us on the, the right path on this, in, on this and avoid some of the perils here? I think, I think we, need to, we need to make sure that the anxiety doesn't hinder us driving the future and developing the right out of the future. We have at the moment so much anxiety, we have so much fear that we lose a little bit sight of the opportunities that we can really create jointly together. Baidu is creating a lot of jobs, we are creating a lot of jobs, we need to make that uh, Right, that the mindset of our, our of our environment at the moment, out of the sudden, has swapped towards a very negative one against technology. We need to reverse it again and say, yeah, it's a different pattern. It will be a different pattern of employment. It will be a different pattern of growth. But we can make this world better if we use technology. Mm -hmm. That would be more my my one wish. And I have, I will tell the panel now as we go down. Every, I'm hoping everybody will be giving different answers. So, Vittorio, by the time we get to you, it'll be tougher. But yeah, Gene. <laughs> What would you? What would be your? What would you think was one thing that we really need to, to focus on to stay on the best path here and avoid some of the perils? Uh, I would say education. Yeah, absolutely. Can you can you uh, just uh, say a little more about what specific kinds of things you 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 are looking for in the education? Oh, yeah. yeah uh, one is uh, just the education, the curriculum, yeah. that's uh, you know, what's being taught in school. Uh, I will, you know, encourage more uh, students learning about STEMs, uh, especially the girls and, and the women. I will encourage people to learn about ethics. In fact, uh, I think the day before yesterday there was a panel, and Microsoft CEO Satya uh, Nadala talked about, you know, school should uh, uh, teach uh, machine learning, computer science, yeah. and ethics together. Right now, in the elementary school uh, or high school, the math, physics, uh, literature, they are all there. But there is no computer science. Mm. Uh, so I believe uh, computer science, the, the ability to code, should be a basic curriculum in, in uh, elementary school, just like math and, uh, Ursula. and the literature. I think we have to take a purposeful, measured, not measured counting, but measured, um, organized approach to uh, increasing participation and access for women and girls. You know, I, I look at this all, all the time, every year, every month, and it is amazing how poorly we are doing as a governing society, as humans, or how well we are doing as humans in excluding yeah. and um, victimizing and in many ways abusing. 50.4% uh, of the population. Mm -hmm. In developed economies around the world, women still get paid eight, now we've moved it up a little bit. It used to be 78%, now it's 82%. Great. Mm -hmm. um, literally, educational attainment for women and girls is significantly lower. We count on men to protect us. We count on men to include us. Mm -hmm. And if we look over, this, over time, that counting hasn't served us very well. This mm -hmm. is women very well. So I, I think that men and women, but now I'm talking about men who are leading we have to actually take a purposeful and measured approach to literally break this problem. Mm. And around the world, we are falling way behind for 50% of the population. We have to fix this. If we don't, then the next revolution will be the revolution from this either big burden revolution, so they will be too expensive for us to take in, mm. or they will come up in arms and figure out a new societal and we have to do something about this. Yeah. Yeah, let me just add, you know, this can be done. It's a great, great point. And I was talking with uh, Eric Grimsey, you know, who's uh, the uh, provost, uh, actually chancellor of MIT, yeah. right? And he was telling me uh, 15 years ago, the, the, the ratio of uh, female engineers, female students, and the men was 19%, below 20% at the EECS department at MIT, yeah. which is uh, the top uh, department <coughs> uh, engineering. And now it's 48 percent, and you know the, the women students doing as good as uh, men students. So we, as uh, the business leaders, need to uh, be conscious and and uh, you know, do that from universities, from uh, 
Uh, Dan Shulman, I want to, uh, uh, you're up. Thank you for giving me more time. To <laughs> um, no, I, I, I will build off of uh, uh, Ursula's remark, which I think are, are right on. I think as leaders, um, what's incredibly important for us, and I used to think differently about this when I was younger, and I, I've come full circle to this, that we need to lead through a set of values that are constant and true. And to me, these biggest values right now are around diversity and inclusion. Um, we need to be sure there's no discrimination of any type. We need to make sure that our companies are a force for good, that our brands stand for more than just making money. Because when you make a difference, you attract the very best to your company. And um, I think uh, the more you are values-led as a company, the stronger you are as a company and as a force uh, in our society. So to me, that, that encompasses a lot of what at least I'm thinking about. Vittorio, it's up to you, I guess, to articulate the regulatory solution, unless you have something else in mind. Yeah, you read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm the last one, so I, I need to, I, I must be allowed to say two things instead of one. The first one, <laughs> come on, otherwise. We'll give you that. We'll thank you. One, the, and actually, the first one builds really on Ursula's comments. Uh, we, I do believe that there is a huge potential for unleashing positive energies from technology. But in order to have that, regulators must ensure competition and avoiding dominance. Dominance kills innovation and eventually takes away the bottom-up uh, springing of things. So I, I really believe that, and they make a distinction between regulators and policymakers. You, you treated them a little bit like the same thing. Regulators, at the end of the day, they must ensure avoiding dominance and ensuring competition. Now, policymakers instead, they go back to my earlier comment, I do believe that since this is going to be bottom up, need to create experimentation spaces where profit, non-profit, and public administration can experiment both public and private goods and see what works and create enthusiasm. I'm on early thing. We need to win the instinctive opposition of people who are ri rightly so worried. I have a small, we, we are, of course, all talking about 5G. In this moment, in the country of my passport in Italy, we are running experiments in, by city. I don't know why Italy decided to do like this, but it's very smart. So we have groups, and we have universities, hospitals, startups, industrial companies, blue blood industrial companies, media companies, all together thinking about how can we redo what we do, and sometimes is the remote emergency room, i.e. the connected ambulance on wheels, which becomes a neighborhood hospital, mm -hmm. if you think about it, which becomes something else, or you know, media, or reallocating public space, not calling staff roads, parkings, or whatever, but dynamically reallocating mm -hmm. for the benefit of people. So, but we need these experimental spaces, which today kind of don't exist. Mm -hmm. And this is really the policymaker job, not the regulator job. There must be competition, of course. Mm. Otherwise, why would I do it? Great. Are, are there? We, we've been gone a little long. Are there questions uh, uh, here? I see a lot of hands. So well, why don't we go right? If you identify your, if you identify yourself, uh, please. Thank you so much, um, everyone, and to this amazing panel. I mean, panel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> one woman on on the panel. Uh, I guess that's. More than none, but uh, certainly appreciate your <laughs> afternoon. I am Injadeka Harry, and I'm uh, the chief executive of Youth for Technology Foundation. We're an international nonprofit organization, and we work at the intersection of appropriate technology in the corridors of education and entrepreneurship. Um, I definitely second and even third um, Ms. Burns and Mr. Zhang's um, expressions about the need to include girls and women um, in technology. I would say, um, you know, with the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, which is an extension, of course, of the digital revolution, and with artificial intelligence, like we've heard and we know, um, taking over a lot of the jobs that historically um, women have typically held in, in corporate, you know, the low paying mm -hmm. customer service type jobs. Um, it is essential that we equip our young women and girls with the necessary STEM skills um, for the future of work. But most importantly, um, when they do have those STEM skills and they come into the companies, whether it's Baidu, PayPal, or what have you, we need them to have not just mentors, which are both men and women, 
but we need them to have sponsors as well in these corporations to ensure that they're not just getting in the door, but they're rising up the ranks and they're staying and actually mm. you know, um, having a very fruitful career. The difference between mentors and sponsors is that mentors talk to you and sponsors talk about you. Mm. And that really helps women um, in the workplace, women in technology in the workplace. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Do, do, we, do we do a question uh, maybe up, up uh, here? Or why don't, we go, why don't we go up to the front here? We've got uh, on the, uh, with the beard on the end. Uh, thanks very much. I'm Pranoy Roy from India. Uh, we are founders of a media company. And I really enjoyed the discussion, but I felt your last question was very critical about mm. what to do over the next 10 years, 15 years. And while everybody touched on it, they didn't quite, I think, hit the point that we see as the big problem today, and that is trust. We don't trust media. We don't trust the government. We don't trust big corporations. It's broken down. We think you have our, our data. We think you're misusing it. How are you going to, isn't that the focus? Build trust again. It's at this low, all the Pew research around the world yeah. finds trust at its lowest ebb ever. I think it's a great question and I think we've all lived that. Anyone want to take that question of can big tech and its, and its advancement, can, can it get trust back or are we just in too fractured a world now today? Do you want to yeah, I think look, in, our, in our example, I, I took over 2013 and at that time, the share market had lost trust in our company. We couldn't Plus. explain where we are going and the portfolio was blurry. So we said we're going to re-establish trust by doing three things. Identity, direction, and momentum. And on the identity side, we said clearly what is the purpose. And we defined what the purpose of ABB is in one line. And on the other side of the, of the medal, we set up a set of five value pairs. And we gave our people these five value pairs. We hardwired them into evaluations. We hardwired them into training. We hardwired them in all kinds of people development agenda. And it was amazing how this, and, and we did the same for the direction momentum, but it was amazing how the trust came back. People knew the purpose of the company. People knew the value of the company. And when you have purpose and value, then you can also give direction and, and have, have trust in the company. If I, if I may, though, if I, if, I, if I understand the question, I think you're asking a broader societal question, right? Which is, we understand of the company, but, but we all know all institutions, including all of our institutions, including mine, are wrestling with a lack of trust that's but undermining It's it. exactly the same. Later on, when we have certain politicians on stage, what is the identity? What are the values? <laughs> what is the direction? And what can we believe in? Yeah, there's something. And I think we need to have that pattern, whether we need it for a company, a country, a whole set of, or any community should have this. Necessary, not sufficient. Yeah. Because then we need to have more transparency, especially yeah. large companies. Yeah. Our problem was we are complicated. We don't have anything to hide, but we are complicated to explain. And you have a lot of, and you do have a lot of data. You have we, a lot of customer we, data. What we did in a couple of occasions where we had real problems, mm -hmm tax, Snowden, this whole area of privacy and so on, the approach we have taken is, listen, why don't we open up? And I have to say, a couple of colleagues told me, you're completely crazy. You're going to be taken to the cleaners if you open up. Actually, it's the opposite. You open up, you engage, you engage with NGOs, you engage with the public. The problem is that our companies are complicated and our people are very good at doing the thing that Ulrich was describing, which is necessary. Absolutely. But then when you have to be transparent, yeah. oh, we hesitation because it's complicated, how can we explain, then we'll be. Every time we have opened up and we have used transparency as a way to create trust, it, it flies. Now, of yeah. course, you have some short-term issues, but in the long-term, it flies. I, I, know, I know more panelists want to speak, but I want to get more questions. And uh, can we take this gentleman here? <coughs> Anna DeBoer from McKinsey. We did this amazing work with the World Economic Forum on the future of production and how, how we can drive technology adoption and diffusion. Yeah. And it's, it's clear that for the next decade, uh, $3.7 trillion of impact are there. So the manufacturing sector will be the one that is maybe the biggest impacted. And there's also a lot of fear. So, so we want to get prepared. We discussed a lot this week around this. So I would have the question to the panel as we are seeing the innovations are there, the technology is there. The problem is that um, only a little of the factories are really seeing them. We are so 
so to say, stuck in pilot purgatory. Mm -hmm. That's what we're saying. And so my question would be, do you have one kind of out of the box idea on how we, as tri-sector collaboration can kind of drive the diffusion? Because once clear, we want to have kind of inclusive growth. We want to augment the, work, uh, the worker in the workplace. Mm -hmm. We want to make a bagger, better workplace. And for that, I think we need to get going here. So out of the box to idea the to get going? I don't think that there is, I, I, I won't answer the question because I don't think that there's one. Um, and I, I think it, it's just not, it's a great idea. We have 7.2 billion people in the world. And of these 7.2, some are at the very high end, very few, and many are at the very low end, and then the rest are sprinkled in the middle. I think we have to, both um, Vittorio and Dan said something that was amazing to me, which is this idea that we have to um, collaborate and companies, nations, societies, not-for-profits, educational institutions, we have to actually start working together. Absolutely. And, we, and by the way, we just don't. <laughs> it's, it's not natural. Governments and companies, my goodness, it's almost at a, it's a total breakdown. So one of the ways that you get trust is that you actually start talking out loud mm -hmm. about what the heck we're doing and what the problems are, making them clear, making it clear that Automation is going to be a problem in the short term. Let's talk about ways that we can deal with this problem. We're actually trying to avoid the, the very obvious that people are feeling and they're sensing because they're not dumb and we're just not talking about it. I think it. I have to say, I think that that in part goes to the trust question as it's well. It's huge. Which I, is, it which is, is it people is. feel it and leaders don't talk about it. But there, there's a, I, this woman has been uh, very patient, so. Uh, Hello, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sona and I'm a global shaper uh, from Armenia. So thank you Ursula for bringing up the point about Armenia and for underlying the potential that- I actually uh, went to Armenia not too long ago. I was in Yerevan, if you can believe that. <laughs> I do believe <laughs> and you're <laughs> always welcome uh, to Armenia. I hope you have felt the hospitable spirit of our nation. Uh, so uh, big tech, big impact sounds quite uh, loud and quite strong. I would like to ask all the panelists to define what does impact mean to you? Uh, can you please keep it to one word or a sentence? <laughs> Thank you. Maybe you should be moderating, I don't know, but... Uh, yeah, let's start with uh, the third. Oli, you're, Oli's ready to go one word or sentence. Yeah, sorry. Now you have to think our, about it. No, no. <laughs> with our technology, we will help to run the world without consuming the Earth. Um, create more jobs and uh, have more responsibility. Impact is positive or negative change in your life. Mm. You want to go while I'm thinking about it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're, You're welcome. Away my five anytime. Seconds. Yeah, anytime. Yeah. I, I, I would say, <laughs> I mean, in order not to re repeat, generate optimism. It's so important to have optimism about the future. Then, how? I think I heard a semicolon in there, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Dan, you're on the spot. Yeah. I think we need to take care of foundational needs. And, and to me, um, that really starts with democratizing financial services. I think we've got time probably for one more question. Uh, we've got a gentleman right here. We can. Uh... Uh, Arun Sharma, I'm a member of the board of Adani Group and Deputy Vice Chancellor at QT. Yeah. I want to go back to your earlier question about tech being the new tobacco. Yeah. And I think the question of trust that Pranoy said is the important one. And perhaps if I look at it, AI, robotics, automation, it's all in the future, it's happening. Uh, but strong AI or artificial general intelligence is the one which will really create disruption. Yeah. And I think we can have the imagination to come up with services to, to, to bridge that gap. The important question that we have today is the platform companies with two-sided networks, yeah. we all know who they are, they take our data, we are very convenienced by that data because they give us some service, but eventually they monetize that data to make huge amounts of profit, and the profits are going there. Yeah. So the fundamental question that the tech community can do is address the issue of ownership of data and monetization of people's personal data, and I'm quite hopeful you look at technologies like blockchain, it is now possible to have a third party 
an independent party that looks at if a company is using my data to come up with a decision that generates revenue, then in a transparent way, a micropayment can be made. If they stop using my data, I don't get anything paid. And I think if this is there, then it will take away some of the solid criticism that we are getting today, and that's how we start building that I, I, I'm glad you brought it up. It's a great, it's a great point and one we wanted to get to and didn't have on, on time. But it, we do have on the stage, and uh, at the end especially, uh, several companies who you do have a lot of data. You have a lot of personal data. Uh, we all live with the hacking risk. And uh, I, the, the model of many of the big tech companies is free services in exchange for your personal data, which, which causes a lot of unease and of course has been a big driver of regulation. So is there a model or a, a fix that can get all of us more comfortable with the fact that data is that kind of currency? I don't know if Dan or Vittoria, well, you have a I mean, I'll start off in the Vittoria, you can jump in. Um, I think it's an incredibly important uh, issue and I think we have to be very crystal clear about what the acceptable user policy is uh, for that. My view is you can never uh, sell anybody's personal identifiable information, ever. And then if you want to use their information, they need to opt in to go and use that information. And I think we also need to realize that we've got new form factors that people are using to consume information. And right now, we have terms and conditions that are sometimes 30 and 40 pages, yeah. and we're trying to look at them on a screen this big. So has anybody ever read any of the terms and conditions in this room? Yeah. No, nobody has. You, you just say, I agree. What do you, what do you, how, how does PayPal do it? So we have longer terms as well. And my view, and I'm working with regulators on this, is how do we create a one, one screen kind of I agree? And to me, that needs to be, we protect your data and information. You know, we never sell it. Transparency of pricing, whatever that may be. And then um, you only give, we only use your data if you opt into it. Something like that, where somebody goes, oh, okay, there it is on the screen. If you want more information, like where we store it and that mm. kind of thing, you know, click here to get more. But you can agree to something that you understand. I think it's very important that we start to shape and work with regulators to be able to create this trust and understanding by um, uh, by making it crystal clear and transparent. Great. There's a small other, this is the individual side and the societal side, which let's call it what it is, there is an issue with taxation. At the end of the day, if Indian data is, you know, what somebody makes money on, there should be some, you call it return, you can call it redistribution to the mm -hmm. Indian society yeah. In, under the form of taxation. And my recommendation to the big two-sided platforms is, guys, engage with the government. Otherwise, it's starting in Europe. Governments will do something that then will be very complicated to handle. So they have, instead of doing passive resistance, they should engage and accept that, you know, this is required. Society needs also that side. We, we could go on for a long time. There's a lot of issues here. We're out of time. Thank you, panel, for a great discussion. <laughs>